Good afternoon. I'm Lark Mason, past chairman of Asia Week and president of the Appraisers Association. And on behalf of the chairman of Asia Week, Catherine Martin, our auction house, museum, and gallery members, welcome. Today's panel discussion, Transported by Art, is one of many sponsored by Asia Week. Please visit our website for information about past and future programs and events that are occurring in the world of Asian art, including our wonderful March celebration and exhibition that will be taking place shortly. We encourage you to come to the website, see what our members have to offer, and I think you'll be very pleased. Now we welcome questions during, the, um, during this program from our audience. And you can submit these anytime through the question and answer box. Our panel of experts that will be with us today are Mark Aston, who is an art transport expert, Maysing Lung, who is a former senior executive with Sotheby's and now works with uh, a retail gallery, Susan Benningson, curator and collector, Stephen Chait, the gallery, a gallery owner, and Ellen Ross representing the art insurance world. Each of them will give you a little bit of background about who they are and what they do. And now, welcome our panelists and then to our program. So we're going to start with you, Stephen, if you would just give us some of your background and then uh, we'll follow up with Maysine. And uh, so go, go ahead. Very good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Chait. I am the president of the Ralph M. Chait Galleries in New York City. Uh, the gallery was founded by my grandfather, Ralph M. Chait, our namesake in 1910. So we are today the oldest specialist establishment in the United States. Uh, our specialty is fine antique Chinese porcelain and works of art. Uh, that includes porcelain, as mentioned, pottery, and all sorts of objects in Chinese art. And we have a lot of experience in transporting them. And, and I am very happy to participate today. Thank you. And may say. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Or uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I, in my long career in Chinese art, I was with Sotheby's for over 40 years. And my uh, roles there included being um, co-director of the Chinese department in New York, the uh, managing director of Sotheby's Hong Kong, and lastly, as vice chairman of Chinese art and Asian paintings worldwide. In 2018, I, uh, I left full-time work and I joined a gallery uh, specializing in Chinese contemporary ink paintings. So that's what I do now. In all the things that I've done in my career, which is sourcing art, researching, cataloging, marketing, selling, the hardest thing I think is actually shipping them out. So I'm very glad to be part of this panel and I am looking forward to learning. And we look forward to your perspectives. Susan, if you would please. Sure. Uh, I'm an independent curator based in New York City, and my current project is part of the Triennial, now on view at the Asia Society Museum here in New York. It's entitled, We the People, Xu Bing and Sun Shen Respond to the Declaration of Independence. From 2013 to 2019, I was a curator of Asian art at the Brooklyn Museum, where I reinstalled uh, the galleries for the arts of China and curated the exhibition Wen Chu Bing, as well as co-curating the reinstallation of the Korean galleries and the exhibition Infinite Blue. As a collector, my collection of Indian temple jewelry, over 150 objects, was the subject of an exhibition organized by uh, the Asia Society Museum and the international tour was organized for the, by the American Federation for the Arts. And that collection is now part of the permanent collection of the Newark Museum. Wonderful, and now Ellen, 
Hello, my name is Ellen Ross, and I'm the Managing Director of the Fine Arts Practice at Arthur J. Gallagher. I took my uh, degree in art history and immediately entered the insurance world as a claims adjuster and an underwriter. Uh, currently, my position at, and my team at Gallagher provides risk management and insurance solutions for the art world. Great, and finally, Mark Aston. Mark, if you would, please. Good afternoon, yes, my name is Mark Aston. Uh, I'm an Englishman in New York. I've been in the antiques and art shipping business since 1982. Uh, founded my own company in 2002. Uh, we provide a comprehensive transport and packing service to private collectors, uh, galleries, auction houses, um, as well as providing um, climate control storage um, uh, here in uh, one of our three, each of our three warehouses in New York. Wonderful, and um, all of our professionals who are part of this panel today, their contact information will appear at the end of the program, and they welcome to hear from you. If, you're, if they are not the right resource for whatever your situation is, they will see that you are put in touch with the right resource. So consider them as professional resources in the world of the transport of art. So we're gonna start, we're gonna go through this program on the basis of what happens from the moment something is in a gallery, in a private collector's residence, and it needs auction house, and it is paid for, shipper is uh, chosen, insurance issues, and it ends up at the final destination. So we're gonna go through that entire process and I'll be leading with questions for our panelists and then they'll be replying. And we hope that you submit some of uh, your questions during this process also. And if you have something that I'm covering, I may not say it specifically, but I'll integrate it into the conversation. So thank you. So here we are, we've had the first purchase of something from your gallery. And I'm gonna direct this to you, Maxine. And you find out the buyer is in, let's say Indonesia, and you're shipping this from New York. And you have no idea who this person is, but you also know that there are some kind of international regulatory issues that govern how things are paid for, the disclosures that are part of that process. Would you describe what you go through? And just for the audience, you know, there are things that have to do with money laundering and disclosures, US Bank Secrecy Act, some of them are international, some are, are specific to the country where the transaction takes place. So you wanna make sure that your item arrives there, but you wanna make sure it's paid for before you ship it out. So what happens, Maxine? Yeah, fortunately in my previous uh, life at uh, in an auction house and currently in a private gallery, we do have specialists on the team who are responsible for vetting because that's very, very important to find out the credibility identity of the buyer. Then after that, before I panic, I would call the people in the field who are professionals in shipping. So I would call someone like Ellen for the insurance regulations, I will call Mark to guide me through what we should do, because that is really one of the trickiest part of it and the things I feel most shipping internationally. And Stephen, what do you do? You know, you're, you're a gallery owner, you're frequently in um, the Winter Antique Show, among other shows, or the Winter Show as it is now, and it just completed, which was, I understand, a, a great experience this year. But what do you do when you have someone coming to your booth and they buy a, a group of things or three or four people do and you've got to get it to them in a relatively uh, expeditious but a certainly safe way and there are these money laundering and disclosure kinds of issues. What do you do to try to figure out who this person is? How do you approach the payment issue? So um, at shows, uh, certainly like at the winter show or a number of our clientele, uh, Fortunately, I guess are Western and often American, so that does make it easier. Um, so in many cases, since we're a long established gallery, it's renewing acquaintances with a, a client who we've had some history with. But of course at each show, you're hoping to meet new people. And uh, in the course of conducting business and transacting a sale, um, you know, there are formalities, you issue an invoice, you would get contact information a name, phone numbers, emails. Uh, we give our information as well. 
as necessary, you could ask for references from other people in the trade. Uh, sometimes historically banking references were done. Uh, but in most cases for payment issues, uh, money is wired to us directly to our bank. Uh, so, or someone gives a check if they're American and, or they have a, a bank that is in the United States. So that sort of takes care of that uh, particular issue. Uh, for most of the shipping, we're driven by a president. My father felt that no deal was complete until an object that's purchased was safely received by the purchaser. So uh, we take the shipping very uh, seriously. For most of the porcelains and small objects, we're able to pack them professionally within our own gallery. For larger objects or things that are particularly uh, delicate, maybe a very elaborate pottery figure or horse, or some sort of uh, object like that, we would go to a professional shipper and they do crating and take care of the details, uh, mostly for international travel. And, and Mark, what do you do when you get a call from um, Stephen and he says, I've got to ship this thing and you see that it's got some um, perhaps ivory inlay or it's an exotic wood and Stephen didn't think to tell you about it, but I'm sure Stephen would. I'm <laughs> you know, you don't make those mistakes. Indeed. But what do you do, Mark? What's your, what, what, how, what's your role? Uh, well, for ivory or some of, some of the exotic woods, then yes, we're going to have to apply for a CITES license um, with the uh, Fish and Wildlife. Um, and then th there is certain information that I'm going to have to get from Stephen or from the, the seller uh, in order to complete that form. Um, some of that information is quite detailed. Um, and without it, we cannot get that export license. And here in the US, um, it, is, it, it is a very, uh, it's a somewhat difficult um, process. It's, it's more difficult here than it is in Europe. Um, so yeah, I, anything with ivory, uh, we need to stop and, and think and start looking at forms and information. And Ellen, from your standpoint, let's say Mark gives you a buzz and says, Ellen, help. What's your role for <laughs> these kinds of issues governing you know, the complexities of going across country boundaries? The first thing that we do is clear the name insured. Uh, we use the government, the standard government agency, similar to a bank, to make sure that that the, the insured is a viable candidate for insurance. And then we begin the insurance uh, underwriting process. You know, ascertaining the details of of the object. You know, um, how it's going to be packed and how it's going to be shipped, so we can provide a, a quote for wall to wall or nail to nail insurance. And. Um... Do you have a preference, Maxine, for payment? Someone comes in with uh, a credit card you don't know uh, or wants to give you a check. Uh, do you have, describe what kind of payment you, you usually work with for international purchases? We usually work with uh, wire transfers. That's, the, the, I think, the most efficient. But then again, that comes with its issues because you have to be very careful nowadays in the light of so many uh, wire transfer scams that you verify the identity of the person who is shipping, uh, who is wiring the funds. And also you have to have verbal verification as to the actual transaction that is actually coming from that person specified or you're sending to a particular person. So verification is really very important. And during this preliminary process, Stephen, how often are you in communication with the purchaser or the recipient if it's a different person? Uh, well, certainly we make contact. At the time of the sale, we discuss shipping. So sometimes if it's, uh, most of our clients are private collectors. And as I said, most are Western. So we have their address, we know who they are. So we'll arrange a time frame to get the object to them. And uh, you know, certainly we'll hear from them if there is a problem. <laughs> we track it through, um, you know, if it, we're sending via Federal Express or through a shipper, uh, we stay in contact with the shipper to find out when it's going to be expected. We notify uh, the purchaser when to expect the item, and then we can verify through electronic systems that it's been there. And most often, we'll hear from them that they've received it and all is well. And if, you know, God forbid there's a problem, then we'll hear from them as well about that and uh, deal with that situation. So it seems like you're trying to do everything you can up front to verify who the person is, 
who the recipient is if it's a different person. But what do you do in the event, Mark, that you've delivered something and then you find out after the fact, the owner, the recipient says, gosh, this arrived and it was smashed. And you know full well that it wasn't, or I never received it, Mark. Do you call Ellen or how does that work? Uh, yes, I would call Ellen. Um, <laughs> I mean, um, the, the, it, it's great to get someone on the ground, you know, at the recipient's address. Um, perhaps I have an agent in, in the area that could go over and look at it and, and give it, uh, some sort of third party opinion um, if, if that's appropriate. Uh, but if it looks like it's headed towards a claim, then, uh, then I would tell the recipient, um, obviously, first of all, assure them that, that this can be taken care of. And then tell the, or ask the recipient to please hold on to any packing materials, any paperwork that they may have signed for for the, for the delivery, um, and then leave it to the professionals who know what they're looking at and, and can bring it to some sort of resolution. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow up with you on a related thing because we're talking about CITES and, and customs. Um, you know, in the initial part of this, filling out the forms, and then, you know, this would occur a little bit later in the process. But what do you do if something is seized by customs? Uh, you can't. It's done. It is seized. Um, so uh, maybe it's a call to Ellen. Um, I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, it's something that we would absolutely try and uh, avoid. And frankly, I would rather and we do, I would rather send documentation forward for it to be examined and for it to be accepted or refused before we actually send the shipment. Uh, and if we do that, we really should know ahead of time whether the shipment itself is going to be accepted. It would not be, I don't think we would have done our job right to actually have allowed the shipment to be, to be, uh, to be seized. In other words, the shipper should be able to predict with almost 100% accuracy that something is going to be safely received and go through customs and it should not be a guessing game. Otherwise, yes, yes, shipper yes. Is not someone yeah. is professional. Yeah, unless you get into the realms of cultural um, uh, objections that, um, and then that that tends to, uh, that, that runs at a very high level and maybe something is, uh, uh, is shipped on the assumption that it's going to be okay because in actual fact, the receiving party wants to seize it. But, uh, but for something like CITES, yes, we can get the documents clarified ahead of time. And Ellen, you want to add anything, any final comments on this? Well, there's good news and bad news on that. You know, um, if it's seized, you know, the insurance is still in place, you know, um, so if it's damaged and, or damaged or stolen while, you know, it's being held, uh, while you're working out the paperwork, you have coverage. But if it's seized because of a title issue or sometimes sometimes there is no coverage because um, it, it, the policy doesn't respond. So there's good and bad news in that scenario. So we're gonna go forward now. This was just the payment preliminary part, getting things organized. And part of that then morphs into, of course, shipping. So. Now that you, you know that that part is paid, it's been paid for. The next step, you're you're selecting a shipper. Maxine, what do you do when you're trying to select a shipper? Do you make a recommendation, or do you wait for the client to tell you? Does that happen both, or do you? Um, and what are the criteria you look for when you're trying to find a shipper, Maxine? Yes, I mean all of the questions all at once because you have to find out from the uh, the collector when he wants it, how fast does he want it? And in, I have worked through all the decades of uh, shipping art with a group of uh, shippers I, uh, I'm familiar with. And within the group of shippers, there are people who specialize in certain art forms. And so therefore I keep a Rolodex, an old fashioned word, of all the uh, shippers who are specialists, whether it be paintings or uh, pottery or uh, porcelain and, and so forth. So I would then make a recommendation to the collector whom I would recommend. And of course, then there's always the issue of cost, but the thing is you just pay the best for the best. 
And I'm gonna I'm gonna switch over to you, uh, Susan. What do you look for as a collector, putting your collector's hat on when you when you loan your things? What are the things you look for with a shipper, or do you relegate that to someone else? Typically, the museum has their own relationships with different shippers, and typically, the museum will arrange for the people to come and pack that object that's being lent for a museum exhibition. But they'll come to your house with crates or whatever the packing materials that are needed and uh, it will all be arranged. So it's usually from a collector's point of view, if the museum's doing its job right, it's really straightforward and easy. And I'm gonna to go to the horse's mouth here, Mark. What do you recommend people ask about when they're trying to find the shipper? Uh, well, I, th I think um, that this, if you're buying it at, at, a, at, a, at a, a gallery, I think the gallery can be a great source of recommendations. Um, in fact, I mean, word of mouth recommendations, frankly, are, are, are very, very good. We look um, for recommendations for uh, partnering with shippers in other cities. So we would go through the exact same um, process as a buyer would for us to find someone in another city that, that is recommended uh, to, you know, to look after a shipment of ours. And Stephen, do you find most people ship by air or ground? And is there a, a liability in having things sent over a longer period of time by ground versus you know, second day air? Well, ground can be practical. So at times it works well. There are art shuttle uh, people you could work through uh, that make it convenient. Something that we haven't discussed is also uh, the person who is receiving the object, the purchaser presumably, uh, you have to determine whether that person uh, can unpack the piece. So if something comes in a complicated uh, crated uh, box, then uh, that can be a complication. We had a client once who was in his late 80s, who a very wealthy gentleman on the West Coast who bought stuff and he told me he's the only one on the receiving end to do anything. So it has to be relatively easy <laughs> to unpack. So he would not be able to manage drills and, and such and all sorts of crowbars. I myself might be challenged with that. So um, if you cannot easily pack it, then you need a sort of door-to-door -door delivery and have a shipper who you can trust to bring it there, un uh, unpack, uncrate the object, and then remove uh, the debris itself. Uh, air, of course, overnight is the best in if there's immediacy but certain delicate things are very complicated to just send anonymously through air freight. You are better off uh, with the shuttle service or uh, going by ground delivery with an art mover or professional shipper. And I'm gonna go back to you, Mark, again. You know, packing and shipping are two different things. What words of wisdom do you have about packing? Well, uh, Stephen's mentioning, you know, air freight. Um, he's also talking about art shuttle. I mean, those are two uh, ways of basically doing the same thing, but but they are very different. Um, and the mode of transport tends to, to dictate how the pieces are packed. So um, air freight, it needs a crate. There's no two ways about it. It has to be crated. And that in itself may uh, bring added um, complications to the shipment. Um, the art shuttles that Stephen mentions, um, you give up the, um, the speed um, uh, they run on a schedule, um, but the truck uh, is driven by two art handlers. And as long as the pieces are packed properly, um, cardboard boxes and the like, unless the object is massively fragile, and then you probably don't want to air freight it anyway, um, then, then the art shuttle is, is a great option, um, but you lose the immediacy. So you have a client who's contacted you, Mark, about a very complicated object and the client is insisting that he is going to pack it himself. What do you do? Uh, well, it'd be nice to maybe have one of our guys stand with him as he packs it. Um, if, he, if, he send, if he hands us a box of his own creation and says there is a piece in it, um, then uh, our paperwork is gonna read as such that it was a box um, said to contain that vase or that object and our paperwork will be checked off as it being packed by owner um, and then uh, I would try and advise the client not to send it by air freight because that really is putting his packing to test um, if he's packed it well and it's handled well from A to B 
um, it should be okay as long as, it, you know, it, the, again, the arc shuttle variation is a good way to do it. But air freight, that's, that's a lot of stress on the packing, and we really need to hope that he knows what they're doing. I've got, we have several questions for the audience. Uh, this is a general question, and I'm going to direct it to you, Mark. Uh, does the buyer need to help with the unpacking? Uh, that um, is the buyer's choice, and it will keep the cost down. Um, however, it's not necessarily uh, necessary, and the buyer can frankly um, answer the door and sign a piece of paper and nothing else. Um, but obviously, but they will pay for that service, but it can be done in most places. And I have another question for you, Ellen. Why would a person or buyer, this is from the audience, not be eligible for insurance? Uh, uh, most things are insurable, uh, but sometimes, you know, um, it's going into an area that, you know, in California, there are restrictions and uh, requirements, you know, because of the earthquake and the fire exposures. Likewise, in Florida and in hurricane zones, um, so, you know, the location could be a reason that um, a, pe a, a piece is not insurable or a location is not insurable. But for, the, for almost everything, um, you can find insurance for it. Sometimes it's, there are subjectivities. For example, you know, if it's extremely fragile, there might be a subjectivity that it is professionally packed and crated before we insure the shipment. So it really depends on the location and the circumstances, but for the most part, we can insure just about anything. And there's another question for you, Ellen. Uh, there's a private collector who uh, wants to show paintings for three months someplace and have the painting shipped and they're at a different location. And at that location, uh, they have to be insured. So the total value of the paintings is appraised for under a million dollars. Is there any kind of additional insurance during that transit period and also when it's added at a different uh, location from the owner's location that there needs to be there is this a case by case basis kind of decision? It depends. I, I would say that in most cases, you know, personal insurance is worldwide and it most likely is covered, but many policies have limitations for off premises or th when things are on, 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 on exhibition. So I would say check your policy, um, you know, and, and make sure that there is coverage. If not, I am sure that the insurance company would allow you to do a rider and, and cover it wall to wall while it's on exhibition to from and while at the exhibition. So I say, check your policy uh, and just make sure before it leaves that it, you have the proper insurance in place. The, the digital world's changed things, Mark. And uh, now we have people selling things all across state lines. And the Supreme Court recently came to a decision concerning state taxes. So what about taxes and state regulations, how that affects you as the shipper? Yeah, that, that, uh, that does affect us. It affects all us shippers. In fact, I discussed this with my peers here in New York, that uh, the auction houses here in, in New York, um, if they arrange the shipping, um, then they will allow um, the, the object, the, the, the purchase to go out of state without payment of New York state sales tax. If the buyer arranges the shipping, then the auction house will charge that sales tax regardless of the fact that they're gonna be given proof that the piece is actually crossing state lines. Um, it is their interpretation. We've challenged it, we haven't got anywhere. Um, and it, it, it has become a bit of a thorn in our side, frankly. Well, there are a lot of thorns on our side when you're dealing with regulatory things that are broad based and that don't account for the nuances and the differences um, you know, from one place to another. So an example is, uh, we have a question for the audience about an experience someone had where they, they purchased a print overseas, the cost that they were quoted to ship it back to the US was $300 and they bought another print from a different location also in $30. So where, where does that variation come from? Just 
from your perspective, Mark. So the first was 300 and then the second cost was? Second for the stuff they 30. And oh, basically right. it's an envelope. That's being right, said. well, yeah. I mean, uh, assuming that whomever uh, quoted the shipping cost is being honest, then the, the suggestion is that they're very two very different modes of transport, <clears throat> each of which comes with um, you know, benefits and hazards. And your experience, Maysine, is uh, with shipping from the auction house perspective. I know my opinion on this, uh, but I want, <laughs> I want you to share yours. Uh, is a prop, was that a considered a profit center at Sotheby's for shipping? Or was that just kind of passing on the cost? Yes, it's a passing on, it's a service provided. Exactly, and that's my experience also. It's definitely not a profit center. It's as much as anything, a customer service kind of issue. Um, is temperature an issue when you're packing something, let's say in a very cold location, and it's going someplace warm, and you're putting it in this tight box, Mark? Does uh, that yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the uh, sudden changes in temperature are definitely a problem. Um, gradual changes, perhaps not so, unless the object has a particular uh, insensitive, insensitivity, uh, or rather a sensitivity to, to um, extreme temperature. Um, you will find that in pretty much any museum, uh, as they receive a shipment, um, it, is, it sits to acclimatize for a day to slowly get to uh, you know, room temperature, as it were. Um, so um, my opinion um, is that the sudden changes of temperature uh, are the problems and a gradual one, as long as it's not extreme, um, is not so much of a problem. About in the, um, you know, the air bay of a freight uh, cargo in a plane, how, how is that temperature regulated in the cargo section or is it not regulated? It's cold. It is cold. So, um, I mean, a foam lined crate, um, it, it probably will, will hold in some heat. Um, there are available um, climate controlled crates, um, but you can imagine the expense. Um, but yeah, that it, it is a, it, it's a consideration um, for something that, um, well, let's, let's take an example as a, 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 a US artist, Rashid Johnson. Uh, his works are in um, um, wax. Um, so <clears throat> regardless of how fast the temperature is changing on a piece like that, you would not want to send that sea freight because even though the temperature in a sea freight container would be slowly changing, it would slowly rise to the point where it would affect the, the, uh, the, the wax. So uh, there are some, uh, um, some uh, media that you really need to think about the temperature. Uh, there's, sp speaking of temperature, and I'm speaking from Texas where we just had this uh, ridiculously cold freeze. But I, but last summer there was there was a backlog in shipping, and in, in some parts of the country it was extraordinarily hot, and a number of the trucks were idled, and not moving very quickly, because of COVID. Mark, what can you say about? The, the temperature controls for fragile items that may have been stuck in a truck sitting in a lot uh, for, for a while. And how do you avoid those kinds of problems? Well, that, yeah, that's com comparing Art Shuttle, which, you know, which Stephen had first described and I've, and I've mentioned as well, which is a truck that is specifically designed for art. And the chances are that's gonna be climate controlled. So the, so the back is gonna be re a reasonable temperature. Um, and would stay within five, 10 degrees or, or the whole time it's in the truck. Um, general freight, um, which with therefore general freight, it's gonna be packed more by, by we packers. Uh, that could be sitting in, in a completely unheated area, either on a truck or perhaps it's been taken off the truck in an interim warehouse during the delay. Um, and it's gonna sit and you're gonna lose control of, of the temperature of that piece. And that frankly is a concern that if you have a piece that's fragile, that's sensitive to temperature, it is something that you should definitely think about um, in the height of the summer or the depths of the winter, could this happen? So if you have a fragile object, this is one of the questions you wanna to, want to ask. 
Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Could, could you go through the benefits or the variation between choosing to ship with a crate uh, or a foam pack or a corrugated box, just from your perspective? Um, well, obviously a, a crate is, is the, the most um, protection. It takes longer to pack. It costs more. Um, it is not always necessary um, unless the motor transfer dictates it air freight or general freight cargo, as we mentioned earlier by truck, or if the piece is exceptionally fragile. So regardless of what mode it's gonna transport in, even a local delivery truck, it needs to be in a crate. So there are times when crates are unavoidable. Um, packing, uh, wrapping an object in you know, simple materials that everyone's seen, tissue paper, bubble, uh, foam sheets, um, foam blocks, uh, boxes lined with foam. Um, suffices um, if done properly for um, for local transport or for the art shuttle transport where the people that are handling the pieces it's what they do um, and th then you get the cost benefit of not having to spend so much money th there's one thing that I that I've felt is that sometimes a smallish fragile piece does better in a box than a crate uh, when you drop a crate, then then the the um, the shock is transmitted um, through the piece, and we've decided that sometimes uh, a box or a double box, a double cardboard box, uh, might actually suit some pieces better, um, just because of that shock transmission. And I'll share an insight on this also: bubble wrap. I can't count the instances of objects that we've received that have sharp edges. And there may be two or three items in a box. They were wrapped with bubble wrap, nothing else. And they arrived in shards. And do you have any thoughts on that? Well, bubble wrap's fine, but it's an exterior package mm -hmm. and there needs to be something done inside. Um, and and yes, yeah, sh sharp corners, um, um, they need to be um, uh, isolated, perhaps with, with a, a finer, softer packing. Um, and then you end up with, a, with almost like a tissue or, or a foam um, ball. And then the, the, uh, the bubble wrap can go on top. But bubble wrap by itself is, is not necessarily going to work. Um, can I say something? Yes, I'm um, shifting I, the uses of it now, so go ahead. Oh no, I was just going to say what Mark was just talking about with bubble wrap is I think a really good example why as a collector, you never want to unpack a crate yourself or unpack something that's come back from a museum exhibition yourself, because if it has been damaged somehow in the transport, the insurance will be so much easier if the professional packer has both packed it and unpacked it. And in most cases, museums will ask you to let them pack and unpack it. You don't want to be involved with that because if something has been broken or damaged, you don't want to start talking about whether you're responsible for damaging it by the way you unpack the crate. So I just wanted that, to. That open, you know that. Um, have you had it, had issues yourself with a poor bad experience with related to packing? Oh no, because I always let the packers do it. <laughs> 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 and when I was a museum curator, we weren't allowed to pack anything. The registrar's office would take care of everything. And, you know, we would come in when they unpacked things that were being lent by other um, museums for exhibitions. We would be there when they unpacked it. But they would have done, you know, extensive condition checks before it was packed and after. So we'd have a list of where there were marks or breaks, previous breaks on the, the work, when it was taken out by, by the art handlers and the conservators would be there too, to make sure that there was no damage, no paint flaking or anything like that. And how would the collector you don't want to be in the middle of that. <laughs> and how would you, how do you choose insurance and the shipper and all these things, Susan? Is that something you delegate to the, that the institution takes care of or do, are you involved in that? Depends on what your, what your circumstance is. If you're lending something to a museum, a museum will have chosen they'll have a, um, a relationship with both an insurance company and with packers and they have their system in place and it's really like clockwork. I mean, when Asia Society came uh, to my apartment at one point to uh, pack up the Indian jewelry, there are 150 objects. So there were individual 
layers trays that then went into a crate and then each piece a lot of the pieces were very tiny so there was like custom they were custom fit around each object it took them so many days to 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 do that but then the exhibition went on to tour to six other museums and so they kept reusing the trays and the crates um, for each of the different venues including the international venue when it went to hong kong afterward so i mean it's really I mean, you have to trust who you're working with. If, if it's something I'm sending out on my own, there's certain shippers and insurance companies that I've worked with in the past that I have a relationship with. But if you're working with a museum, it's very straightforward. And um, as the people on this screen show, everybody knows who, you know, there are a handful of people you would trust to, depending on what kind of art it is, whether it's a piece of sculpture, whether it's a piece of porcelain, whether it's a piece of jewelry, whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, we have the professionals here on the screen who do this all the time, so they know what they're doing. So for the collector, it's very straightforward. Thank and God. Ellen, <laughs> Ellen, who covers the cost of the insurance? For a museum exhibition, the museum covers it door to door. Yeah, and Ellen, who do you, when you're in your experience, what do you? It's, uh, it's true. Generally speaking, there's a loan agreement that clearly outlines that the museum is going to take care of the insurance from the moment it's removed from the walls of the collectors to the moment it's returned, nail to nail, wall to wall. I think it's important for a collector to make sure that they receive a certificate of insurance evidencing the insurance in place, naming them as an additional insured loss payee on the museum policy. This allows them to have, you know, take part in the negotiations and be part of, uh, of a claim, the claim process. God forbid something happens. And, and things do happen. I've had pieces that have had some damage when they've gone to museum exhibitions and then the museum is in charge of well, the museum will pay for the conservation to repair the piece if it can be repaired. And, and it, it'll be a discussion. Is the piece too damaged? Do you just want to take the insurance value for it? Or is it something that you, you can be fixed or you have such sentimental, has such sentimental value to that you want to have it repaired? But they'll pay for the conservation, but you'll help, well, in my case, in any case, I helped decide who I wanted to treat it. And I helped decide what treatment I wanted for the piece, but then the museum paid for it. And Stephen, how about you? When you, a client has something, you're, you're, you're shipping it out, what, how do you deal with the insurance part? Is that something you're concerned with or is the, you ask the client about it? Right, as a gallery, we have a, a what I consider a very good uh, fine arts policy. Uh, we have worked with, we do work with Arthur Gallagher and iterations of them prior to that for many years. So uh, as a convenience, honestly, and I think as a courtesy to our customers, um, purchases from us are covered through safe delivery, uh, generally uh, up to a certain amount of money. If there's something that's super expensive or super complicated, uh, we might take out a separate uh, policy for that object. But uh, it, we have found it's easier on both ends to just have things on our own uh, fine arts policy, and it's been successful. Macy, how about you? I, I think that uh, Stephen's case is uh, pre pretty standard for, for galleries. They would, uh, would uh, cover the insurance until the object arrives on the person's doorstep. But for the most part, um, nowadays, the collector is responsible for the insurance the moment he is the owner, the moment and, of purchase. And Ellen, can uh, someone who's loaning a work of art, this question from the audience for an example, but should the owner rely on their private insurance or sign on to the museum's insurance policy? No, I think that, you know, for the most part, you know, uh, you look at the loan agreement and the institute will provide insurance. You know, very often we say, you know, um, leave it on your policy. You can use your policy as backup. Uh, but I believe that, you know, if an institution is borrowing it, they should take responsibility and provide insurance and ensure that it's safely returned to the owner in the same condition. And if, if someone has their own insurance and the museum is offering insurance or insisting, um, what are the other options for the owner if he doesn't want to use the museum's insurance policy? Certainly, um, almost every policy will allow you to retain the insurance. Um, again, we would check to make sure the policy covers uh, for there are no restrictions or limitations 
for the for the object to be on loan to make sure that there's sufficient transit and insurance uh, for the transit to and from uh, the institute. But for the most part, you know, if you look at your uh, look at the agreement, you know, the insurance will follow the uh, the agreement. Whatever you agree upfront to, who's going to insure it? Generally speaking, we can we can make sure that the insurance coverage follows that that agreement. And what is the circumstance that would negate the insurance? Gross negligence of some sort? What would that, how would you describe what would cause that? It's very easy for me to tell you what, you know, what is not covered because insur uh, fine arts insurance is extremely broad. So wear and tear inherent vice is not covered. Um, war, nuclear is not covered. And, um, you know, there are some other, restrictions on the policy, uh, but for the most part, almost everything is covered. You know, fraud, intentional fraud is not covered, but for the most part, everything else is covered. And one of the, you know, part of the insurance part has to deal with uh, the other organization that I'm, in, that I'm the president of, the Appraisers Association. And there are standards within the our fine art appraisal practice called called the Uniform Standards for Professional Appraisal Practice. Can you discuss that a little bit, Ellen? Excellent point. You know, um, part of the, the, the insurance process is making sure that we're insuring the object to value. So one of the tools to make sure that, you know, it is properly insured is to have it reappraised. And we always recommend uh, reappraisals when there's a change in the market trend, there's, you know, anytime you want to lend a piece to a museum, it's a great opportunity to update the values. And we always recommend that you use an accredited appraisal, appraiser, and that follows the, 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 the standards. So moving on, the object has been packed, it's shipped, and now it arrives. What do you do, Mark? What should someone do when the object arrives at their doorstep, their gallery, the museum? What, what should happen or what happens? Well, first of all, sign the paperwork <clears throat> and keep a copy. So someone's delivered it to you. Um, they will ask for your signature. Um, read the, you know, look at the paperwork, <clears throat> sign it, keep a copy. If there isn't a copy to hand to you, take a copy. Um, and then, uh, as as is you know suitable get the uh, the package inside into your gallery into your home or wherever um, if it's a crate then you may need help with that uh, and then set about unpacking it slowly and carefully if you're not sure about how you're unpacking don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call the packer call the shipper and say hey it's arrived um, I've, I've unscrewed the lid there's a box inside what shall I do? If they can't hand, you know, if they can't answer it immediately, they'll get, you know, they'll call you very quickly, and and you can use them as a resource. It is just as easy to damage a shipment whilst unpacking it, mm. as it is uh, to damage it whilst, uh, you know, whilst it's being transported, or even, in, in fact, it's more, probably more of a risk during the unpacking as as it is during the packing. May I say and describe the arrival process from an auction house perspective? Well, uh, that's a, a team of special uh, receivers who are specialists in themselves who will open the crates and will make sure that everything had been properly uh, packed. But in the case of really, really important pieces like fine porcelain, a specialist from the department is always on hand to observe and to make sure that it's taken out, as Mark said, very, very carefully. And also to have a camera on hand to record the condition and also the contents of the packing material. And Susan, with a museum, what's the process? The package arrives. Just give a brief overview. It goes to the registrar's office, to the shipping department, and they unpack the crate. Um, if it's something that's uh, of really high value or something that's very important, the curator will be there while they unpack it, and but the registrar will do the con condition check on it. Um, and so it's really straightforward. And Mark, it arrived. 
and there's obvious damage to the double walled corrugated box. What should someone do? Right, so if there's external damage to the packaging, then you need to um, make note of it immediately. Um, mark, make note of it on the delivery note. Um, take a photograph. Uh, everyone has a camera in their pocket these days. Take a photograph. Um, then I would recommend you call the shipper and say, hey, it, it's arrived. The box is damaged. What should I do? Um, just because the box is damaged, your piece might may well still be fine. If the, you know, so it's not necessarily a disaster, but it would be a very good idea upon you know, the discovery of external damage of the packaging that you call the shipper and say, yeah, this, this box is beaten up. There's a hole in it. I'm going to unpack it now. Um, and then everything's, everything's recorded. Um, if you keep these things documented, then, then there is a great network um, there in place that's going to help you put it right if there really is a problem. And what happens if somebody just puts it aside and they don't look at it for three weeks? Oh. Well, it, all is not lost, but it just complicates the issue. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, uh, depending on whose insurance you know, it's under, if you bought insurance from the shipper, um, the shipper might be displeased if you haven't made the notation immediately. Um, if you've used your own insurance, um, maybe the fact that it's a blanket policy and the piece is on your premises, it's covered. Um, but your insurer is going to want to find out how it happened because they're going to want to subrogate the loss. They're going to blame, they want to blame somebody. So it's better to deal with it immediately. And Stephen, you just got the call from Mark because this thing arrived and it's your top client and the top client hasn't seen it. It was opened up by the by uh, you know a friend or something, or just noticed. What do you do, Stephen? So uh, third hand, I guess I would say, um, or second hand, what has been said, document everything, take photographs. Uh, I would notify our uh, insurer, uh, in this case, Gallagher, <laughs> and tell them there's a problem. Uh, one should assess you know, how big a problem it is. Is it a minor damage? Sometimes that can be fixed uh, simply and that can be handled between you and the purchaser. Um, if it's a significant damage or a huge um, effect will happen to the value of the object, then it definitely you need photographs and then uh, we'll often have to write a professional um, opinion about uh, loss of damage and what has happened to that piece. And the loss of damage is a separate appraisal. Yes. Um, I believe a separate appraisal room. And <laughs> Ellen, so again, this hasn't been opened yet, Ellen. I'm asking you a question though. Has it been opened? And you can see visibly from the outside, should somebody open it? How should they open it? Who should open it? And under what circumstances? How do you deal with that, Ellen? And assuming it hasn't been seen, it wasn't done immediately. It's been three yeah. weeks people have been out of town. Yeah, well, you know, we always recommend that you open a crate immediately. You know, we do get calls that says, oh, yeah, we received that crate six months ago. Uh, there was no visible damage. You know, this is a bigger problem. There's no visible damage to the crate, but when they opened it, they found damage. The piece was damaged. So, you know, we always recommend that you open as soon as possible. So we know that we can end that transaction and say that it arrived safely. But if it is damaged, then um, the process is, of course, to open up, uh, evaluate the damage. You know, we often recommend, you know, we, it's a collaborative effort. Who's going to do this? We, we, ask the, we ask the owner, we will ask the, you know, the seller, who is the best person that, will, that can provide a treatment report. You know, sometimes it's someone local, sometimes you know, you know, it's better to ship it to another location if it's, if it's stable enough to do that. The function of insurance is to have it you know, uh, put back to whole. That is what insurance does. And we want to do it with the best possible conservator, the best possible people treating it. You know, um, it's not the cheapest usually, you know, but we want the best possible for that particular object, for that particular type of damage. 
once it, the, you know, that uh, it's restored, um, you know, we, we go to the appraisal process and that is bringing in someone to, to evaluate the piece and to tell us if there was a loss in value as a result of the, uh, the damage. And then, you know, we file some paperwork and hand over checks. The idea of the insurance is to cover all the expenses related to that transaction, the shipping, the experts fees, the restoration costs, anything associated with getting that piece back to its uh, as best as possible, the original condition. And who submits the damage claim when you get the call? Do you have the, the owner submit that claim to you or you just work with them over the phone or is it the gallery? Who does that? Well, it depends on who's doing it, who's insurance. You know, uh, for the most part, you know, our policy allows us to keep everybody involved in, in, in the whole process. The owner, um, certainly it's their piece, they own it, they, should, they, they must and should participate in the process. But very often we engage the gallery because they have the expertise and, and the relationship to help guide um, this whole process. It can be very traumatic, you know, um, collectors love their objects, you know, so it can be a very emotional thing sometimes, but we like to keep everybody involved, everybody informed on every step so there are no surprises. So if you have a general household policy, it's not an art policy and you're shipping something of high value, should you be concerned? You you probably don't have a lot of coverage. Um, you know, um, your homeowner's policy has some off-premises uh, coverage, uh, but certainly it's not the type of coverage we would recommend for fine arts. Uh, fine arts coverage is usually taken and, and, and done separately as a personal articles floater or more specialized coverage to give it a broader coverage base. More, you know, like marring and scratching would automatically be covered under the fine arts policy and it's not under your homeowner's policy. So, you know, if you have a collection, we strongly suggest that you purchase the, the specialized fine arts covered for that collection. It's not that expensive and it does provide you much broader coverage in terms of what's covered and also generally moves it from being just covered at the home to worldwide coverage. And we all hope things arrive safely. So on the basis of something arriving safely, Mark, what would you advise someone to, to do when it arrives safely at their house? Should they call the gallery? Should they notify them? Or should the gallery that be something that they do? That it's arrived safely? Yes. Well, um, thank, thank the shipper. Um, <laughs> I, I think that, um, you know, so often in, in life and in business, uh, you only hear the problems. So um, the, the buyer, if he was to, um, you know, send back up the line to the gallery, how, del how delighted they are to have the object now. Um, if they get the time to, to, to talk to shippers or packers that, that everything had arrived very well. Um, I, I think it's a fantastic thing to do and you, you benefit from it in my opinion. Um, but something I touched on earlier, um, keep, keep the documentation, you know, so you, you've received the piece, it's in good order. Um, before you lose it, put that waybill in a file or something, it may, it may prove useful at some point. Um, um, and, uh, and dispose of the packing materials wisely. So we all have interesting stories and I thank you all of right, right now for what we shared in this Q&A uh, and the participation of the audience. But I want each of you to share a story about some kind of momentous transport, the transporting of art issue that has arisen. So we'll start with Maysine. If you would do that, please, and then we'll go forward from there. Maysine? Okay. Um, first of all, I, I just uh, would like to show you an image of uh, some of my favorite things that were shipped. And um, uh, Rochelle, do you, can you put the horses on? This is the way uh, I like to ship uh, horses in the past. I've shipped horses of different sizes. 
And I had a favorite shipper called David Jackson. And wherever I was, whether I was in Hong Kong or New York and had something to ship to Indonesia or to London, he would fly over to mummify the horse for me. And that way I felt comfortable and confident that it's going to arrive with its legs unbroken. And uh, okay, uh, my, um, in, I've shipped many, many things, uh, paintings and pottery and so forth, but there was one interesting shipment that will always remain in, vivid in my mind. When I was in Hong Kong, we had a, a consignment, a shipment of jewelry. And uh, one of the pieces was, happily and unhappily, a diamond which was over a hundred carat. And the insurance, insurance company told us that we had to have a special armored vehicle for it with its own group of armed guards holding elephant guns. And we had very little time, so we had to agree. So the shipment arrived and there were two armored cars waiting for them. And the security officer had his two bags and he put one in one car and the other one in the other. And he arrived in the office and he was taken to the strong room and the safe was open and the security officer put the cases in the strong box and the men with the elephant guns left. The security officer then reopened the strong room, reopened one of the boxes and handed to me two dozen fantastically fresh bagels from New York. <laughs> and those are the most expensive bagels I've ever had in my life. <laughs> How about you, Susan? What experience can you share with us? Sure, um, there are two, two, two experiences. Rochelle, can you bring up the, the images? So the first has to do with an exhibition that's currently on view at Asia Society that I mentioned that's part of the triennial. This is the installation view of the exhibition. So I asked two artists, uh, Sun Shun, whose work is on the right, and Xu Bing, whose work is on the left, to respond to the Declaration of Independence. And an 1833 copy of the Declaration is in the middle there. So next slide, please. So this is the work, it's, um, it's a silkworm book. So Shubing took a book, uh, which is the Analects of Confucius. And in the silkworm project, what happens is the silkworms are, are, are then placed on the book and then um, they move around on the book, weaving their webs of silk. Um, so the final product is, um, the work of art is incredibly fragile. That's all spun silk. And you can still see the silk cocoons um, at the top and the bottom of the image. Um, and this was done in his studio in Beijing. And then we had to get it from Beijing to New York for the exhibition. So there's actually only one type of silkworm that you're allowed to export from China. So it had to go through all sorts of exports, export certification in, in China. But then it had also had to go through fish and wildlife in the United States. Um, but thanks to Shubing Studio was fabulous during the whole process and so was Asia Society. So it worked out pretty well. But as you can see, it's a super fragile work um, and um, happily it arrived safely. And the second work I wanna talk about, um, next image please. And this is for the, from the permanent collection of the Brooklyn Museum. So if you go see the new Chinese galleries um, at Brooklyn, you will see this on view. So this is a scholar's rock made of ink. It's cast and the, the, um, the mold had over 200 different pieces to it. It's about three and a half feet tall. And the artist Zhang Jinjin made this at his studio um, in Shanghai. It was a commission for Brooklyn Museum. Um, so you have a number of different issues. First off, it's incredibly fragile. Um, and it's actually made of different pieces. It's been cast, but it's made of different pieces. But then it's also made of ink. So if it gets wet, ink dissolves. It's the same ink you would use to do ink painting, Chinese ink painting. So um, I would say that this was um, fraught with anxiety, getting this from Shanghai to Brooklyn. And then we had another episode where it had to actually be mounted um, uh, you know, a specialized mount was made for it in the gallery. So, you know, thank God for fabulous designers and art handlers at Brooklyn because 
um, and the conservators too. They took very special care of this and it's in wonderful condition and on permanent view in the gallery. So you should check it out. So those are my two stories. Thanks, Susan. Steven. So I have uh, two simple anecdotes. Uh, one took place in the early 1970s when my father and grandfather were on a buying trip to Europe. And in those good old days, you could sometimes be connected with people who had private collections uh, in England in particular, and they were connected to this one gentleman. They went to see him and he had a wonderful collection of objects and they purchased uh, many of them. And among those was a certain type of vase that my grandfather had always loved from his early days in the early 1900s, but had never had one uh, before. So they purchased it and he was so excited. Um, while everything else was being properly and professionally collected by uh, shippers in the following days, uh, don't do this at home. Uh, they took the vase with them back in their car <laughs> probably wrapped very carefully in an overcoat and scarf. Uh, they arrived safely back at their hotel, had a private uh, dinner in their room and placed the vase at a chair at the table and it was the uh, special guest for that evening. <laughs> uh, one you could do at home <laughs> is another anecdote, uh, was that we had a client from South America who wanted to buy a birthday gift for his brother. Uh, it was a significant birthday. So he purchased a porcelain object uh, but he was very concerned about shipping logistics and it arriving safely. So the uh, easiest and best method he determined was to purchase this carefully packed item, its own first class ticket on an airline and it flew in high style to South America and made it there very safely. <laughs> and I think had a very good time <laughs> on the way. And Ellen. I, t I have many, many transit stories uh, because unfortunately a lot of claims happen during transits, but I do have a, 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 a cute one. I, I got a call on a Friday afternoon from one of my museum registrars and said, Ellen, check the news out. Uh, and I turn on the news and there was a major traffic uh, accident on the George Washington Bridge involving an art move, uh, a truck with art in, with our art in it. Um, and there were, it was major damage. And so luckily we called, we were able to call the art mover. He was able to get an alternative truck there. We offloaded the goods and, and got him onto the new truck, got him to the warehouse. Everything was absolutely fine. So the only casualty was the, the four hour uh, traffic jam that was caused by the accident. And Mark, you. Now my, my business can be very, very interesting. And we've talked about individual objects and the like up until now. But sometimes we get involved in very large projects. And one of those was uh, in, I believe, I'm just looking at what the date was. I can't believe it was 2004. Um, after Hurricane Ivan, we were called upon to evacuate a valuable collection of art from Grand Cayman um, back to uh, secure storage. We chose a place in Florida. Um, it was two or three days after the hurricane. There were no commercial flights going in. Um, the airport was barely reopened. So we had to charter um, aircraft. We chartered a, a jet from Fort Lauderdale to get myself and the Packers over to the island. Uh, we chartered um, a Russian um, Antonov cargo aircraft to come off the island about a week to 10 days hence after we packed the objects but we realized we needed to get packing materials onto the island and there were no commercial flights, no air freight, no nothing. The only flights going into the island were relief flights for the Red Cross and the like. And I frankly thought we'd hit a wall and we were never gonna get around this. I called my aircraft charter and I said, Peter, another Brit at JFK, I said, Peter, what are we gonna do? The only flights going on the island are relief flights. And he paused for a second and said, Aston, you idiot, who do you think's flying the relief flights? They're my aircraft. How much space do you want? So in amongst the, uh, the indispensable um, supplies after the hurricane was a uh, pallet of bubble wrap, cardboard boxes, tape and the like for us, which we then used to pack up the art and flew it off the island. And there are many more stories. Thank you all, our panelists. We appreciate all the information you have. And to our audience, thank you for joining us. Join us again for Asia Week this March. Go to our website 
And also on the last page you, of this presentation, you will see the contact information for our, our wonderful guest. Thank you all. Good day.